Hi everyone who's joined the call. Welcome to day two of IIH's Capacity Development Forum. We're very happy to welcome you all to another afternoon of insightful discussions. We have a great lineup of speakers and panelists today. We hope that you do enjoy all the panels and uh, sessions uh, this afternoon. Um, quick rules before we get to the session itself. Um, please ask your questions in the Q&A box that's available. Uh, please feel free to chat on the chat box. Keep adding comments relating to whatever is happening during the session and meet other folks. That's also the point of this forum, basically a platform for us, uh, capacity development professionals to meet each other and talk to each other about what we do. Um, yeah, and uh, please raise your hand in case you want to ask Deepak something uh, very urgently. Otherwise, we'd still advise that you put your questions in Q&A uh, box. All right, and um, yeah, let's move on to session one. For our first session of the day, I welcome our guest speaker, Deepak Sanan, to talk about theory of change and capacity building for urban development, challenges and opportunities. Deepak Sanan is a former civil servant retired from the IAS, Indian Administrative Service. During the course of his career, he has worked across sectors and has advised both state governments and the government of India. He has undertaken many assignments over the years as a consultant with several multilateral uh, agencies as well, uh, relating to his skills and experience in public finance, urban and rural development, and especially in relation to the water and sanitation sector in India. He currently advises the IIHS on a variety of subjects related to his experience and special interests, particularly land governments. Over to you, Deepak. Thank you, Ashwarya. So let me begin by saying thank you very much for inviting me to this, uh, to this forum. I, uh, this is not going to be an academic uh, discourse of any kind on theory of change. This is going to be my perception of coming from my background of what I felt has worked and what is traditionally seen as the root and what has really worked for me and my experience with uh, trying to do capacity building in various ways in relation to core areas uh, of both sanitation, solid waste, etc. and what has been my experience with that. So I'll start by saying, so as I said, I come from a practitioner's perspective of both implementing and to some extent, of course, uh, making policy. And uh, what was it that really affected me in my career from very early days was a certain discomfort with the fact that almost all capacity building seemed to start with the idea that we are a poor country, finance is a major constraint in everything. We need to do a lot and we need to spend money. And we have too few people with technical knowledge of what to do things and we have to impart technical skills. And therefore we need to devise and design programs to which will give money and which perhaps will also give some technical inputs or at least uh, say that technical inputs can be procured and we will try to overcome or reach the objectives that we want through this and therefore the entire focus of capacity building has have, and continues to be, in my view, to a very large extent, on programs, their features, what is needed to deliver them, and how are they will be, how will they be monitored, what will be looked at, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What does it miss? In my view, what I found the actual practice for me behind all this. I'm not trying to say that finance is not an issue that technical skills are not required. Both are important, but are subsidiary in my view to, and this is my career perspective, that the bottom line is that we need to understand that there's something more, which is about behavior which needs to be addressed. 
because if it was only about finance and if it was only about technical skills then six or seven decades should surely be long enough to have made a difference and we still don't seem to we seem to be constantly running to say in the same place we are inundated with the same kind of messy problems we seem to have started with we are constantly talking about slip back we are constantly talking about you know the fact that oh we are too big we have such a large population we have so many increasing numbers and you know we are just inundated and we are just talking about every now and then we are talking about small islands of the good which somehow are maintaining a precarious existence or lapsing most of them are not even sustainable some may sustain for a while in a very isolated way so what is it that really this this always bothered me for decades it bothered me in government in my early years in my career how do we address this what what really needs to be done to get around this and for me the the issue was that there were apparently one of the constraints was that while we were working with this programmatic understanding and saying i have to deliver an understanding of the policy which has to be implemented the program the scheme which is to be implemented in the field by a machinery and therefore i must give the scheme feature that what needs seeks to be achieved through that to all those people whether it is an amrut today or a jain and you are in uh, you know a few years ago or it was low cost urban sanitation before that and it was you know different ways of doing uh, talking about different services and how to get them across to people or what was it that was really uh, so so how are we beyond the programmatic thing how are people really looking at them and i found in my career that people were actually it wasn't just a silo of not learning from different sectors or different laterally from different areas which were doing things it was also a silo of created by a certain understanding an academic understanding in many of our systems so to take an example from sanitation the the whole mindset was that the answer to densely populated urban areas was sewage network sewage and for the poor deliver some toilets and some maybe some public toilets and some individual low cost toilets etc in rural of course it was all about only delivering some rural toilets low cost toilets this sort of thinking that it was just a problem of some infrastructure to be delivered some technical knowledge to be thing and this is the problem this is all i need to do it extends to even urban planning spatial planning in urban areas where the whole thinking i found when i worked in these departments the whole idea was that there is a certain concept of spatial planning it in, involves strict zoning it involves strict uh, ideas of what uses are permitted in which in different areas what kind of grid lines have to be drawn for planning and that's what is most important we need to adhere to that so again it was this silo was constricting all ideas of thinking outside this that what could be or what were possibilities so in solid waste it was always about collect and somehow remove and possibly dump somewhere so what was really needed to break this to me after looking around and not even looking around but wondering more than anything else for years about how to break this this log jam of thinking in a particular way and problems which continue to exist and even multiply and grow at the other end and i am supposed to be making a difference to those problems and i am not making any difference and i am 
even as I'm talking the government programs, the government policies, the government schemes, and trying to explain to people, please do this work and monitoring their work and writing down and, and, and devising the formats to monitor their outputs on the program. And we seem to be making very little difference. There could be paper victories. There could be isolated examples of success. For, and those become the, the big beacons and trotted out. Oh, just replicate that. Isn't a case of replicating that is what came to me time and again. And so what could be done? To me, the, one of the key breakthroughs was my association with CLTS, with community-led total sanitation. The learnings which came to me in that, and I will just briefly for some of you are probably very well acquainted with CNTS and very <coughs> and know it possibly even better than I do. But my understanding of CLTS was <coughs> came from the concept of CLTS of what was really inhibiting rural sanitation. <coughs> it wasn't that there was no scheme for sanitation, that there was no machinery to implement those schemes. It was finally a case of that there seemed to be no real need in the collective, in people as communities, to really look at the idea of confining and disposing of human waste safely. This understanding, this realization, this awareness seemed to be absent. And possibly the real issue to confront it was somehow to find a way of getting the collective, the community, the, the whole to think, to understand what was really wrong, why is sanitation really desired, and how, to, what kind of behavior change we need to adopt to get there. And once you had people analyze their own behavior, understand their own shortcomings and the reason why they need to change, then as a supplementation, you could deliver the technical knowledge as a handholding mechanism, a facilitation mechanism. But the sequencing is important. If you do the technical first, which is what we end up doing through all our schemes and programs, then we are prejudging and already saying, we know the solution. And here's the solution in your hand, and you just need to build toilets. Whereas the whole idea of CLTS is, first people need to feel that they need to make a change of, in their own behavior, and then you can empower them with, with some tools of how they can effect that change in terms of actually doing some infrastructure which is required for this purpose. The second thing which CLTS taught me was, that the incentive structure is very important. If people have to really genuinely analyze their own behavior and look at ways to change it, they must feel it is their own problem. If somehow, if they feel that it is somebody else's problem and they are being asked to change behavior for that purpose, it's not going to succeed. And this is the standard problem of all our programs, which are constantly saying, top down, I am giving you, this is your problem. You need to change and adopt this infrastructure, this, this uh, may make this happen to solve your problem. But actually for people, therefore, this is becoming your problem. The other, the externals problem, it is not a problem of the community because you want me to do it. You must be having some interest in it. I have no interest in it, I'm doing fine. All the, if, if my shit is in the open, if I'm dumping garbage all around me, if, if, if I live in a mess and I don't seem to notice it, then I'm doing fine. But you want me to sort it out? You got a problem. So the first and most important is get rid of this impediment. Don't start your conversation with what you want to give. The conversation must start with what 
I want to learn from you. What is your problem? What are your issues? How do you live? And you, I'm just asking you these questions. And from that, I need you to analyze your behavior to get there. So for me, this was the greatest learning because having stepped gingerly through piles of shit to reach villages early in my career, to reach habitation early in my career, to reaching a stage where there was entry, entry to villages in Himachal, in my state today, is beset with solid waste, but no longer with open defecation. What brought about this change? And that for me is the greatest success I have witnessed in my career in applying CLTS in Himachal Pradesh. We, we actually devised and designed and implemented a no subsidy collective change approach. We abjured, we said SAM subsidy, no subsidy in 2005 we announced and it took us a few months and a few years, few months to start designing and talking about the kind of capacity building this required for a collective behavior change approach to be effective. <clears throat> and that is what led to a, a capacity building module being first designed for CLTS over five days and being imparted in order to create a sort of army of motivators who could spread out across every gram panchayat and village in the state, district by district, make, do the trainings, empower the people, the, the motivators, get them to understand what they really need to do, have the tools, equip them with the understanding and tools of CLTS. And that resulted in seven years with rural sanitation coverage in Himachal Pradesh for households going up from 28% to 84%. Zero, zero expense in subsidy. Virtually no expense on the program in those days called total sanitation campaign. Because this was just about interpersonal communication with a certain band of motivators and it really needed very little money. So this experience is what has motivated my thinking on capacity building in the years which have followed. I have in the last few years spent time on designing and structuring what I call ODF plus, open defecation free plus sanitation uh, designs for delivering uh, motiv uh, training for motivators to work with communities on <coughs> reaching an ODF plus situation and a separate module on solid waste management. Because not only is this a very visible problem, but it's it seems to have become a burning problem with, with certain amount of need and how to really get that need going. So we worked on solid waste management. I have had occasion to try out my module in one occasion till now. And frankly, the results were most encouraging and very motivating for me in the sense that at the end of five days, if I could get, if motivators could say, this was the most enlightening experience of a training in my life, that, did, that I started this five days as a skeptic, as someone who didn't really believe anything was possible. And I've come at the end of five days, understanding that communities can actually change the solid waste management situation of their areas on their own, almost entirely. And that kind of understanding, that kind of feeling for me was what theory of change is really about, what change is really about. And that experience has led me to try and do this in other spheres in, in their different ways. I have recently designed a, a training program on land governance in relation to spatial planning. So land administration and spatial planning. Where are the disjuncts? How do I address them? And again, similarly, I looked at evidence. What is the evidence on the ground? Where is the disjunct between spatial planning and land administration? What is the understanding of, 
of practitioners, of people who are involved with this, of one side or the other, and let the evidence from that speak, and let that evidence bring about the search for solutions and what needs to be done to improve the whole area of spatial planning in India. So I'll end for the moment here. This has been short, I know, but I'm hoping that there will be questions and there are people who want to, who, <coughs> who are most welcome to ask me any questions because I've kept it short deliberately so that we can actually have some kind of interaction. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Deepak. Um, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. I don't see any hands up. Okay. So either this has been completely... No, no. no this was really useful because uh, this is a conversation that we've been having even yesterday that... Um, it, it, Capacity building for the sake of capacity building is not really helpful in any context. And the purpose of capacity building, finding that purpose and then taking it from bottom up, uh, that's that's the conversation that we've been having. And to bring it up with examples and really talking about that sector, I think someone has their hands up one second. Kavita, Kavita, I've allowed you to talk. Yeah. Hi, Deepak. Hi, I was hoping somebody else would ask, but I have questions given that we work on similar sectors, at least in sanitation. Um, two, one is, uh, I see your point about training not being technical and about uh, change of behaviors. And I know you come from a very different position, which is CLTS and all, but increasingly, my discomfort has been that when you're looking at programs, whether sanitation or water or otherwise, there is a particular discourse around behavior and to me seems like a supply driven thing like is right so people need to realize or whoever is the target need to realize their behavior is bad and we need to change it right so where do you i mean i don't know where do you see the difference between behavior change as you say it? because that is something different he has understood right you're coming from a very different position uh, and also, so behavior change to me, then what gets lost in BCC as it's practiced now is the whole thing of ownership, right? Um, so I don't know your reflections on that because this thing about then BCC becomes again about changing behavior and not about letting people take ownership. And secondly, the CLTS example, I know the solid waste management was in context of uh, government offices. I'm also wondering how does some an approach like CLTS translate into government officers uh, and and I'm the reason I'm asking this question is the sense again is the technical training decided and what is really needed is for the ULB officers or the frontline officers who may not be I mean they are not given the kind of autonomy that they should get so where do you see the CLTS kind of approach working with you know, people who are actually in the front line and making the changes within the government systems, but may not have the necessary, necessary empowerment. So it's, your points are very valid that we are really implementing CLTS in an overall environment, or I won't even say CLTS. I'll just say implementing behavior change, collective behavior change with ownership in an overall environment in which there is pressure to deliver scheme outputs. And also, as you said, uh, what Paramayar has, you know, perfected in his uh, tenure in uh, rural sanitation, the idea that trainings themselves are an output. And um, this is the route, we've given it to you. Just go out and train and we are counting the trainings and how many trainings are done and that will, will, will uh, automatically translate into behavior change. And um, it is your task to change behavior. That's the biggest impediment. The idea that it is the trainer's task, the program's task to change people's behavior. No, how do I change this mindset and things? Win in policy is a very uphill task. 
extremely uphill task because it's completely schooled in the perspective of top down completely and 100%. And it is not willing to give it up. In the current setup, I can't see making headway in this direction is going to be easy at all. But what is required is really careful facilitation, very, very clear idea to be conveyed through your trainers that ownership is key. The analysis is by the community. You are only doing some prodding. It is finally the community, the collective, which must own, which must perceive their problem and do something about it. Nothing else matters. And if you, you have to be prepared, and I have seen this happen a number of times where you turn around and say, okay, you guys don't want to, it's your problem. You don't want to address it, it's not my problem. I'm not here to sort out your problem. I just thought that, do you have a problem? Are you seeing a problem? If you're not seeing a problem, that's great. I'm very happy for you. Let's move on. I'm very happy to learn this from you that you don't have a problem with a lot of shit lying around, with a lot of garbage, a lot of waste all around your neighborhood and everywhere around. You guys don't have a problem? Wonderful. I'm, I'm going to take a lot of pictures. I'm going to make a video of this because I want to show a lot of people how this wonderful community doesn't have a problem with all this. They live very happily with this. I just want to show other people also that this is possible. This is great. I want to end with that and not sarcastically and not with a feeling that I'm making fun of you. I'm willing to walk away with that. That is what somehow is required, it's very difficult in the current environment to convey that. Because we are so driven by targets, we are so driven by the things which we need to do. But I'm still giving it a shot and trying to go to some districts now and trying to do some of this solid waste uh, and uh, ODF plus work in districts and saying, let's just spend a few days and doing this and see what kind of results we can come with very careful. If we carefully facilitate to give the right ideas. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yes, yes, you have. Yes. I mean, it's not a very optimistic one, but you answered my question. <laughs> And just to follow that up with another question uh, to both of you, actually, Kavita and Deepak, do you think that uh, sectoral, uh, the sector sometimes um, dictates or limits uh, uh, the imagination for capacity building programs? Or uh, you think it's uh, human behavior uh, that can be transposed across every sector? Uh, uh, so I, let me qualify that question. Like, uh, for instance, uh, sanitation, you can take it down to the absolute last user and the user or uh, beneficiary of that program uh, or the person who, uh, you know, they, they are the uh, final uh, cogs in the wheel which make it work. But for instance, if you take planning, where institutions are in play, where we may not have to think about uh, we uh, the uh, the behavior of the uh, end user. So, do you think there is a distinction between sectors so far as CB program design is concerned? Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that if the ultimate uh, person or the ultimate uh, 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 the ultimate where you want to deliver your program yes. is, is about uh, not uh, the, the, the citizen at large, but is mm -hmm. the intermediate implementer. Mm -hmm. How do I get that intermediate implementer to mm -hmm. uh, the intermediate implementer to feel that mm -hmm. they need to change their behavior too, right? That's yes, the yes, that's the question. I think the same approach in a modified way, modified not in terms of the core principles. The core principles will remain the same, as I said. 
the core mm -hmm. principle is to make even that practitioner, that implementer, that 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 skill technologist, that person who's a spatial planner, etc., want to make them reflect and understand, make them reflect on their situation and what they're seeking to achieve, and analyze their own views on it, and therefore come up with the solutions. This is actually what I'm trying to design in a in a training program which I've just written out in a formative stage, in a draft stage for mm -hmm. spatial planning. Because this is an area which also interests me a lot, that spatial planning is really such a hidebound uh, discipline which say, sees itself as, as the repository of all knowledge about spatial planning and a certain received wisdom and, and doesn't really need want to admit and just says, people are going all wrong. They're just not following our prescriptions. They, they don't want to listen to us. I think it's very important there to, to internalize and, and to understand what is, so where do we start, Anutama, your point? You want to start with what is the ultimate outcome of, the, of what you're seeking to do? What does spatial planning seek to do? Does it seek to deliver a beautiful master plan? Or does it seek to deliver a better, happier uh, way of living for people? where people are happy and, and, and face less constraints in living. It's not the master plan. It's the latter. When, when, you, when town planners can understand that, then they can see that there may be a disjunct with what they are thinking of as master plans and what ought to be master plan or plan. And, and, and I'm trying to see if I can bring that, uh, that, that sort of... Uh, distinction and that understanding. It's not easy. It's not my core area, but I'm trying. I'm giving it a shot. Thank you so much, Deepak. Uh, and actually, you reflected the uh, opening point which Billy Cobbett and Aro made yesterday. They also started with this exact same point that uh, whatever capacity building is being done, what is the ultimate uh, outcome uh, uh, and objective? And uh, that needs to be clear then CB starts making sense, otherwise, uh, maybe not so much. So uh, thank you for that, uh, Deepak. I think that was very insightful. Uh, Aishwarya? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Deepak. We will close that session. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll join you guys tomorrow in the morning if you still want me to come. Yes, yes, please, please. Please do. Uh -huh. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.